Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will see the definition of uh, inner semi-direct product and uh, from that I will motivate how to define uh, external uh, semi-direct product. Okay. So, we will not actually get into too many details, uh, but later we will use the concept of semi-direct product and then I will tell you some applications of uh, Silos theorem uh, with this. So, let us uh, start with uh, the definition of uh, inner semi-direct product because which is something uh, very easy to understand. So, in the last class uh, we saw a situation that uh, G can be product of uh, two subgroups, one is normal but another one is not normal but still the intersection being trivial. Okay. So, in that situation uh, we are actually only uh, uh, seeing that uh, the only condition that differs from the direct product is that uh, one of the subgroup is not being normal. Okay. So, but uh, with this condition let us see what one can actually get. So, for that let us uh, uh, prove a theorem. So, let G be a group okay. again you can assume to be finite group. So, with let us say H subgroup and n normal subgroup okay so this is the condition is given so then one can prove the following are equivalent so what they are so you can say that g is the product of these two groups and h intersection n is trivial so this is something uh, we saw naturally happening in one of the examples so, when order of the group is uh, product of two distinct primes. So, this is equivalent to G being again product H n and H intersection n is trivial. So, these two are equivalent is something very easy to verify. The third condition which is somewhat very relevant. So, this is relevant to actually I would say direct product. So, G has this property for all element G in G. So, this can be written uniquely okay, as a product of elements from n and h. So, there is a tuple n h from n cross h such that this g can be written as n times h. Okay. So, now we can also change the role again for all g and g there exists again tuple n h unique tuple that is what important g is equal to h and the following is actually uh, somewhat uh, more important uh, characterization of this semi direct product. So, which is called uh, actually the group g is given by extension of h by n. Okay. So, this is called the group g is given by by an extension not necessarily one extension and extension of h by capital n. So, what is the meaning of that? There is a natural group homomorphism, there is a natural group homomorphism from g to h such that when you restrict pi to h that is the identity map on h and when you take the kernel of pi that is exactly n. So, that means we have this split exact sequence identity n g h identity. So, this is actually a split exact sequence. Okay. So, the condition that we have written here there exists group homomorphism from g to h such that pi restriction h is identity and kernel pi is n is same as saying that using this language of exact sequences we have the split exact sequences the splitting is actually happening here. So, the splitting is given by the inclusion of h in g. Okay. So, then in that case you say that the group g is given by an extension of h by n. And uh, note that there are many possible extensions uh, are there. Okay, and then uh, so for the inner semi-direct product, you already uh, fixing H and N. And once you fix H and N inside G, the way H acts on N is also fixed. 
I will come in a minute like how H acts on N we will see that. But before that let us actually prove that these are all equivalent. But uh, so 1 and 2 are equivalent is, is actually easy to see. So 1 if and only if 2 I will leave it as exercise and similarly 3 if and only 4 is also exercise. So all we do is 1 implies 3 and 3 implies 1 and 5 I will leave it as again exercise okay. So 1 if and only 5 that also I will leave it as exercise. So what we are going to prove we are going to prove that 1 implies 3 and 3 implies 1. So let us look at uh, 1 implies 3 okay. So what it says given any element G that can be written as uh, product of elements, elements from capital N and capital H in a unique way. So we have to use that G is product of this N and H and H intersection N is identity. So let us prove this proof of 1 implies 3. So since G is N H for given G in G you can see that G can be written as N H for some N in N and H in H. So that is trivial just from the definition of G equal to N H. So now in case G equal to N H and then N dash H dash. So then the, from this you can see that N dash inverse N is same as H dash H inverse. But uh, these elements, so one element is in capital N, another element is in H. So this element should be in the intersection H intersection N. But which is trivial, that is what one says. So that means this N dash inverse N must be identity and H dash H inverse should be identity that forces that N equal to N dash and H equal to H dash. So that means the tuple N and H is uniquely determined by the given element G. So this is what proves uh, 1 implies 3. So now let us look at 3 implies 1 proof. So assume that any given element G can be written as product of elements from N cross H. So that immediately implies G must be equal to N H because for any given G you have a tuple N H such as G equal to N H. That means if you take the product N and H that should be exactly G. Note that N being normal in G, N H will be equal to H N. So it must be a subgroup. So now using this uh, condition in 3 you can see that G must be equal to N H. So now uh, we want to prove that N intersection H must be trivial. So why that is the case? Let us start with X in N intersection H. Then this X can be written as now X times identity and identity times X. Note that X is coming from N and H. So that means the tuple X E is coming from N cross H and as well as E X is also coming from N cross H. So there are two tuples now from N cross H such that X is written as product of those two elements X E and E X. But you know that there exists only one tuple uh, such that uh, this can happen. That means these two tuples must be equal that forces that x equal to identity. So that means 3 implies 1 okay. So it is somewhat easy characterizations it is not that hard but uh, it actually possess one of the important information that we usually have it for the direct group that is given any element g in g there exists unique tuple n and h such that g equal to n h okay. So this is uh, true for the direct products but this is actually a characterization for semi direct product. So now uh, if you think about it semi direct products naturally arise in the context of group theory. So basically so, so this extension of H by N that is the natural thing. So the usually what we do not know so we are interested in constructing G from the smaller groups possible groups okay. So this uh, this N and H both of them are smaller groups. So what do you want to do? You want to actually somehow to find some group here in this middle so that this becomes actually split exact sequence. If you construct something like that then you can see that that group 
will satisfy these properties that h and n become subgroup of that such that h is subgroup and n is normal and uh, g will be nh and n h intersection n is trivial all these conditions will be satisfied okay like i said there are many non isomorphic groups that can be filled in the middle okay uh, but in some situation when you take uh, that z modulo p z and z modulo q z then there is only one way to fill in between so that means uh, there is only one non isomorphic of course one one uh, abelian group will be there and uh, one uh, non abelian group will be there okay only those are the two things that you can fill here so if you think about it uh, if you assume h is also normal then this is actually like uh, trivial exact sequence so that means you can fill g to be h cross n so basically we are trying to generalize the concept of direct product okay so if you take g equal to h cross n so then both h and n are normal in g okay so then uh, whatever you are filling here in the in the position of g that is the trivial thing that you are putting that is the direct product but somewhat we want to get a non trivial uh, groups coming out of from this uh, n and h okay so that's what uh, we want to do but uh, unless we under, unless we understand how one can actually do from the how one can construct from the smaller groups then it is not complete okay so but uh, how one can actually start with the smaller groups and then construct uh, such direct uh, semi direct products so let us see uh, from this inner semi direct product itself so basically once we understand the inner semi direct product then we will be able to understand how to co construct this external semi direct product so what i mean by that uh, so let us see like once you are in this situation that uh, g is uh, semi direct product of this h and n then what other properties of uh, this g can be recovered let's see so first of all <coughs> there is a natural action of h on n okay you take h and then you have this ma natural map uh, phi from h to automorphism of n that is given by let's say h goes to p phi h so how the phi h is defined which is a map from n to n so you just normalize given element x goes to h x h plus okay so i will leave it to you to check this is indeed uh, uh, group homomorphism okay so check g is phi is a group homomorphism so this is easy so now using this group homomorphism what we want to do we want to write down the product of elements of g okay so we know that given any element of uh, this g can be written as product of elements from n and h okay let us use that so let us take g g dash from g then you know that g can be written as some n h g can be written as n h and g dash is written as n dash h dash so in the direct product what happens if you take g g dash in the direct product so this is going to be n h n dash h dash but these two thing will actually commute so this is h this is h dash so this will be exactly n n dash h h dash so this is what will happen in the direct product but that is not going to happen in the semi direct product because one is normal another one is not normal so then closely look at what happens to g g dash so this is going to be exactly n h n dash h dash so now what i can do i can multiply by h dash inverse and h dash so you take n h okay so maybe i will do it here so i want to bring n n dash here n n dash i group them and then n dash inverse sorry i need to do it the other way so because this h is acting on here so let's write g equal to h n and h dash n dash 
okay so both are possible so then if you take this this is hn h dash n dash so this is going to be h h dash and then h dash n h dash inverse h dash n dash okay this is how i am grouping so then so all i am using g equal to h n so that is all i am using so then you can see that g g dash is equal to h h dash so this is happening in h okay this is just a product in h so now here you can see that this is h dash inverse n h dash and then n dash so this is another product but if you think about it this is exactly h h dash and then this is what this is phi h dash inverse applied on n and then you are taking n dash so indeed what is happening here okay so this is just a product that is happening in h which is g dash but this is also element in capital n okay but instead of taking n n dash this is the usual product so this is the usual product in capital n but what we are doing we are taking this twisted product which we call it n star n dash given by this phi so what is this this is you apply phi h dash inverse on n and then you multiply by n dash okay so basically given tuple h n and then h dash n dash okay so you want to define the product the product actually comes uses, uses this phi okay so you can you can simply take okay for example to construct g all we are going to say that g is just a cartesian product of h and n because there exists unique tuple h n such that g equal to h n for all g in g so that means as a set it is exactly can be identified with h cross n as a set no issue but on this set we are defining a new product using this automorphism phi using this automorphism of phi okay so that tells you that if you take this h n h dash n dash both h n and h dash n dash they come from this h cross n okay this is the set a new product so this is the new product which uses this phi and then you are defining it to be h h dash comma now look at phi h dash inverse apply it on n and then multiply with n dash so this is your new product okay so this twist is happening in the second component so this is the twisted product it is not the usual product if it is the usual product then you, what you get is direct product but now you are making a twist this is the twisted product using this automorphism phi using this automorphism phi so that is why you are getting something uh, something funny and this product of course depending upon phi so so such a group okay one can verify that this is indeed a group and this is actually given by this uh, automorphism phi okay this is semi direct product of h and n or extension of h by n using this automorphism phi okay so this is either called extension of h by n using this automorphism phi or the semi direct product of h n h by n okay so this is the way you construct new group using two given groups and this extra information that uh, phi which is a uh, map from h to automorphism of n okay now there are many things needs to be checked okay i will leave it to you to check that uh, this h cross n with respect to this new product is indeed a group is a group okay so what what i mean by that okay so basically what, what is the data i'm starting with i'm starting with a two group h and n so these are all two groups and then you have another automorphism from h to automorphism of n 
which is denoted by h goes to phi h and then phi h is a map from n to n and this is just a home automorphism ok this is just automorphism not necessarily given by the conjugation ok. So, then using this data we are taking this set h cross n and defining this star phi ok on this elements on h cross n. How we are defining you take two element h n and then define this h dash n dash. So, this is going to be h h dash and then phi h dash inverse applied on n and then multiply with n dash ok. So, now we are claiming that this h cross n with respect to this star phi it is actually a group which is called semi direct product of h by n using this uh, automorphism phi ok or the extension of h by n using this automorphism phi. And of course, by definition you can see that these semi direct products are they very much depend upon uh, this automorphism that you choose ok. So, maybe uh, you take it as exercise if you take z modulo p z and then semi direct product with z modulo q z when p divides q minus 1 then you get uh, so this does not depend does not depend upon the choice of automorphism choice of from H to automorphism ok in the non abelian case in the non abelian case ok. So, that means you will be getting up to isomorphism only one semi direct product ok. So, this actually kind of gives you uh, some information about semi direct product as I said ok I, I am just outlining the concept of semi direct product which naturally motivated from the inner semi direct product. So, now you can check that these the, the usual properties of groups satisfied using uh, using some using the information given ok. So, now uh, let us see uh, some more applications of actually uh, Sinus theorem ok. So, I will actually end with uh, one important application. So, one can make it as a theorem. So, if uh, order of g is less than 60 and g is simple. So, then one can claim that order of g must be a prime which is less than 60 ok. What is a simple group? Recall that g is simple if it does not have any proper non trivial uh, normal subgroup ok. So, if you take a group of order uh, which is less than 60 so and if it is simple then you can prove that uh, the only such group is prime order groups. So, that means if you take a group of order which is less than 60 and if it has prime factorization uh, at least 2 primes are involved ok. So, then you can see that that must be actually not simple ok that is what this is. So, we have already looked at uh, these examples when order of g is prime square it is abelian. So, this case we are done order of g is p q and p and q are distinct primes we have done because we showed that uh, silo q subgroup must be always uh, normal. So, this case is also done. So, then the what will be the remaining order? So, if you just go through the all numbers from 1 to 60. So, then uh, the remaining orders will be like something like this 12, 18, 20, 24 etcetera ok. And then you can choose each and uh, every uh, number and then check it, it cannot be simple. So, I will actually demonstrate uh, just for uh, uh, two particular orders. So, let us start with uh, order being let us say 12. So, I will do only one or two examples ok. So, then you can see that this 12 is actually 2 square into 3. So, now we claim that uh, this must be uh, not simple that means it must have a normal subgroup ok. So, let us use this silo theorems and then conclude what happens. So, let us look at n 3 
it is number of uh, silo 3 subgroups. So, then the n 3 should divide 2 square and then n 3 should be congruent to 1 modulo 3. Now, the chances are n 3 is 1, 2, 2 square. Now, since n 3 is congruent to 1 modulo 3, so 2 cannot appear. So, 2 cannot appear, but it can be 4, either 1 or 4. But if it is not normal, okay, because we want to claim that there is one normal, okay, assume that there is no normal, then then that forces that n3 is 4. Now similarly, look at n2. So n2 divides 3. So n2 must be either 1 or 3. But n2 is let's say congruent to 1 modulo 2. So then you can see that uh, n2 can be either 1 or 3 both are possibly. But if n2 is not equal to 1, then that forces that n2 is 3. If n2 is 1, then we are done, okay. otherwise n2 will be 3. So, let us see that n2 3 and n3 4 both cannot happen. Okay. If both cannot happen, then one of them must be 1, that is what our analysis says. So, why both cannot happen? So, if you take uh, for example, n2 is 3, so, that means there are 3 silo 2 subgroups, silo 2 subgroups must have order 4. Okay. So, that means if you remove this trivial element, then if you look at one particular silo 2 subgroup which has order 4, except the identity all other elements will have order 2 or 4. Okay. So, that means the number of elements of order 2 or 2 square is going to be there are 3 groups. So, 3 into remove the identity. So, 3 into 3 that is 9. Okay. So, similarly the number of elements of order. So, if you take silo 3 subgroup that has order 3 identity except identity all other elements will have order 3. So, if you take number of elements of order 3 that is going to be there are 4 groups remove identity. So, then it will be just 4 into 2 which is 8. So, then if you add identity 1 plus 9 plus 8 then the order of the group should be at least this. But what is this? This is actually 10 plus 8 18 which is a contradiction because our group is given to be having order 12. So, we started with group which has order 12. So, that forces that. So, both cannot be 3 and 4 that means one of them should be 1 that means group of order 12 must have normal subgroup of either. So, either silo 2 subgroup is normal or silo 3 subgroup is normal that is what it says. Okay. Similarly, let us look at another group let us say the group of order 30 and then you can divide this into 2 into 3 into 5. Now, look at n 5. So, n 5 divides 2 into 3 and then n 5 is congruent to 1 modulo 5. So, this forces n 5 either 1 or 6 because it cannot be 2, 2 is not congruent to 1 modulo 5 and it cannot be 3, 3 is not congruent to 1 modulo 5. So, that means n 5 is either 1 or 6. Now, n 5 is 1 then we are done. So, assume that n 5 is 6, okay, otherwise we are done. So, now let us look at n 3. So, n 3 divides 2 into 5. So, then you can see that n 3 is congruent to 1 modulo 3. So, that forces that n 3 is either 1 or 2 or 5 or 10, but 2 and 5 both are not congruent to 1 modulo 3. So, this is just either 1 or 10 because 2 is not congruent to 1 and then 5 is not congruent to 1 modulo 3. Okay. So, that means n 3 has to be either 1 or 10. If n 3 is 1, then we are done. So, assume that n 3 is 10. Okay. So, so once you assume n, n 5 is 6 and n 3 is 10, that is already huge. 
So, you have assumed n 5 is 6 and n 3 is 10. So, now let us look at uh, silo 5 subgroup. There are 6 subgroups that you are, you are seeing, but if you take any non identity element that will be having order 5. So, the number of elements of order 5 is exactly 6 into 4 that is already 24. Now, if you take number of elements of order 3, so then you can see that because silo 3 subgroup has order 3, silo 5 subgroup has order 5. So, this is again you take non identity element in each subgroup that will have order 3. So, that means 10 into 2 which is 20, but this is already 44, but 44 is strictly greater than 30 which is a contradiction because we are started with a group of order 30, we cannot have 44 elements in that group. So, this counting says that uh, one of this n 5 or n 3 is 1, there is no other option that means one of them must be normal subgroup. So, similar analysis can be done for all other uh, possible uh, orders okay, which is strictly less than 60. We already seen that a 5 which has order 60 is actually uh, simple uh, group and one can prove that that is actually smallest simple group, okay, but this is the analysis that we are doing. Okay. So, maybe like I will end with uh, uh, one or two actually exercises, okay. again these are all uh, applications of uh, Silos theorem. For example, if you take the order of the group to be p square q, so then uh, you can see that g is not simple. Even including p equal to q case one can handle because when p equal to q it is a group of order p cube which is p group that center must be non trivial that we have already seen. When p is not equal to q again we will have g is not simple okay that is something you can verify directly. Suppose you have a group of order 2 p and g is not abelian. So, then one can prove that this G must be isomorphic to the dihedral group uh, D 2 P. Okay. Again this can be done in uh, two different ways either use Cauchy's theorem or you can just directly use Silo's theorem and then prove the existence of order 2 and order P subgroups and then order P subgroup must be normal. Okay. So, you take this P to be odd prime. So, this is odd prime. So, then uh, you can prove that uh, this uh, subgroup of order P must be normal and it, mu it must be unique. So, G must be actually semi direct product of this EZ modulo 2 EZ and EZ modulo PZ which is you can prove it to be uh, isomorphic to the dihedral group of order 2P. Okay. So, that is how the proof goes. Okay. So, one can actually make uh, much more uh, uh, applications. Most mostly like silos theorems uh, can be used in un in understanding uh, group groups of uh, small orders of course once you uh, once you are comfortable with the semi direct product then you can easily see that uh, the groups of orders groups of small orders can be actually uh, constructed from other groups of really small orders okay and then if you if you want to actually uh, try to see whether some given group is simple or not again using this analysis of uh, like uh, if you are dealing with really group of uh, small orders like p square q the number of prime factors are very less then immediately you can conclude that okay something about the simplicity of the group using silos theorem okay so these are all some important applications of silos theorem Okay, with this uh, we are actually uh, ending with the applications of Silos theorem. Okay, I will stop here. So, we will continue with the continue in the next class with the structure theorem of finite abelian groups. Okay, thank you very much.